Welcome to the Biz Owner 360, a podcast where we explore a variety of topics to help you grow your bootstrapped business. I'm your host, Brett Trainer. Each week, I have conversation with leading experts in the areas of growth, leadership, and productivity where they share their insights. This is not the typical podcast. We have conversations that dig deep into each of the topics we cover. The goal is to provide you a cutting edge but proven tactics and strategies to help you grow your business. The Biz Owner 360 podcast is now recognized as a top 5% international podcast and growing. My guest today is Espen Fries Jensen. Espen is the co-founder of Userflow, a high growth bootstrap SaaS business that is doing this with only two full-time employees. He's also a co-founder of another high growth company, Cobalt, that raised almost 40 million. We break down the pros and cons of each path, plus how they're scaling user flow with only a couple of employees. See a trend with some previous episodes. Now, onto the interview. Good morning, Esmond. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, it's great to, great to have you on and, you know, one of these multi-dimensional conversations that we can have because with your first company, you raised a bunch of money and grew it. And the second company, you're now bootstrapping and growing it really fast. So I, I think this is going to be a really interesting episode. But before we, we jump into that, why don't you share with the audience a little bit about your background, uh, maybe the first company that you started and then we'll we'll dive in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, I'm uh, my name is Esp. I'm, I'm one of the uh, I was a founder of a company called Cobalt. Uh, well, I am still a founder of a company called Cobalt uh, <laughs> uh, that we founded back in 2013. Uh, I'm originally from Denmark and my three co-founders of Cobalt were also from Denmark. But we founded the company in uh, Silicon Valley um, and I've been here ever since. So live in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, we grew that company. Uh, when I left, it was about 150 people. Um, uh, we raised, uh, yeah, I, I always forget the numbers, but I think around like 40 million a, um, a million dollars. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, really just grew a, an amazing company. It's an IT security company uh, that basically allows you to do what is called a pen test as a service. So basically penetration testing of your web applications uh, or, or mobile applications, but in a modern way where you kind of get it uh, delivered via a platform and you work with freelancers and so on. Um, so that was an amazing company. Um, and I, I, I worked with the, the team on that for eight years. Uh, but then last year, uh, I decided to step down operationally uh, to join uh, my, my good friend, Sebastian, uh, as a co-founder in a company called Userflow. Uh, and Userflow is a company that basically allows you to build um, in-app guides, uh, product tours, and surveys. Um, so you can basically build in-app onboarding inside your own product. Um, so we are selling a lot to software as a service companies who are looking to improve their onboarding. Um, and uh, uh, they don't have developer time to do it. Uh, but with our tool, you can do it in a no-code uh, kind of fashion. Um, so yeah, and we're a very different company from Cobalt. We're just uh, two employees and one freelancer. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a very different different company and, and we're also bootstrapping. Um, so yeah. Okay, that's awesome. And yeah, I, w- I kind of want to go back to the, the first company too, because it's talking about polar opposites, right? Um, when you came to, when you founded uh, Cobalt, was that a... Uh, what what was the idea or the genesis for the idea? Is it something, the idea you had that said, hey, let's go to the States and start a company? Because you were at Accenture as a consultant prior to that, right? Yeah, so yeah, I started my career as a consultant in Accenture, uh, but I always had the dream of, of uh, starting a company. Um, I, I felt that would m- make a bigger impact in the world. I always wanted to have more impact and also kind of own the delivery more. As a consultant, you go do a lot of exciting stuff and you help a lot of companies, but... You you are kind of you are that's in the title right. You are a consultant. You're you're not the final owner of of uh, of the thing. But when you're building a product yourself, you own the product. You own the mistakes of that product. You you have to stand up for your customers if that product is not working and so on. So 
so yeah, so that that was something I wanted to do, and also have something that made a bigger impact on more businesses, and that more businesses would use. Um, so that was kind of the the motivation for starting a company, uh, and and I think my co-founders in Cobalt had similar motivation. They wanted to uh, do something exciting, start a new company. Um, and so we joined forces in 2013 uh, and it was basically none of us, and that's pretty interesting, none of us came from the security industry. Uh, really? We were all from like working in IT, right? But but none of us had prior experience from security. Um, but we were just really curious about the whole security space because uh, we were seeing a lot of uh, websites getting hacked. Um, and, and we were kind of wondering why, why is that happening all the time? Right. Um, and then we had also heard about Google doing this, uh, uh the bug bounty, uh, programs, right. Where they invite security researchers to come and find vulnerabilities in their uh, web applications. Yeah. And then if you can find something, you get paid a, a bounty. Um, so that's actually how Cobol started. I initially it was a platform that would uh, allow any business, uh, even without the resources of Google, to set up such a, a bounty program uh, to, to basically mm -hmm. um, invite and, and, and reward uh, security researchers for finding vulnerabilities in their website. Um, yeah. And then over time, it pivoted into becoming this more structured penetration testing platform. Um, and, and from there, it just took off uh, and, and really grew really fast. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you must. You must have found an, a, a good opportunity because it's tough to raise, you know, four, it's tough to raise a million dollars, let alone forty million dollars. Yeah. So you must have found some folks that that believed in what that vision or what the the opportunity was with that space. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, th these uh, millions were raised over several rounds, right? So it was more in the beginning, you raise one million, then you raise a bit more. Uh, so you kind of, you establish more and more trust in the market, right? I, I think today uh, you could probably go out and raise a lot more money uh, off, the, off the beat. And actually you could so uh, as well back then. Um, but uh, I would, it's always something I say to other entrepreneurs who are very kind of um, impressed by all the funding rounds. Be a bit careful with that because uh, you're, you're setting expectations very high. Uh, your, your, uh, your investors are going to expect you to do better before you do a, another round. And if you, uh, before having any real revenue or anything, go out and raise 40 million in a single round, you have a very <laughs> tough expectations to live up to, right? Uh, because your your valuation is much higher than your actual revenue uh, uh, justifies. So, so I think in Cobalt we did it. I in, in in my view a better way where you do it more step by step, right? You you kind of you 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 raise, but you raise at a valuation that makes sense um, given the the revenue you're currently on and the growth projection you're currently on. Um, and, and not just uh, uh, based on on a, a dream, right? Uh, because the, the, right. the danger of a dream is uh, often they end up in uh, not having product market fit, right? And, <laughs> and one of the big things yeah. that we were able to do due to this more iterative funding approach was exactly to pivot our whole business model, right? Because we hadn't raised 40 million on some, you know, uh, a dream of bug bounty programs, right? Uh, we could actually right. change and pivot our model into penetration testing uh, because we were not, you, you know, we, we, we hadn't really found product market fit with the bug bounty model, right? So we needed to do that change, but it, that would have been much harder if you had raised money uh, on the bug bounty model. Yeah, the clock starts ticking, yeah. right? As soon as you can take that check, and exactly. you have different people, different ownership groups in there. Yeah. yeah, I'm a, like I said, I'm a big fan. There's a time and place for for definitely raising money, but I think there's, to your point, a lot of entrepreneurs would be better served bootstrapping it as long as possible, unless there's some rush to market. But most of the time, you're going to be competing. So how do you execute some of those companies? So, yeah. so perfect segue into. Uh, the new company, yeah. right? So you, you made the decision you don't want to be a professional fundraiser anymore. We're gonna, you know, bootstrap this, and 
you know, maybe dig into kind of the, the, the Genesis story of, of that, you know, obviously must have saw a gap in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, kind of so, walk us through how you started growing it. Yeah. So my, my co-founder got the idea. Actually, he was building another platform um, that was um, a platform that basically, it was kind of in the vicinity. It was like a platform that allowed you to build um, uh, product uh, videos but uh, in a recorded sense, so you could like record a video and then you could re-record it without re repeating the steps. So let's say your UI changed the colors, then you could re-record it and then do a new video. Um, so I still think that's a pretty good product, but it wasn't really taken yeah. off uh, in the same way as our current product. Uh, but one thing he had done inside that uh, product was that he had built a product tour that basically uh, showed the user how to use the, um, this uh, other product. And people kept asking him, uh, how can we build uh, something like that? How can we build that in-app uh, product tour that you have? Um, so, and that kind of then uh, uh, gave the idea of, uh, of user flow. And when we started looking at the market, it was really, it was actually, a, there's a lot of competition, right? Um, but uh, what we saw the gap uh, was really the, the UX. It was really hard to build these flows uh, with a lot of these tools. So they, they say they are no code, but really when you're no code, you need to be extremely easy because uh, <laughs> otherwise you would still require developers to build it, right? Um, so, so that was a gap we saw in the market that there was still big UX challenges with these products. And that's the, the, the gap we, we kind of sought out to, to uh, close. Um, and I think we've done a, a pretty good job on building a builder with a lot better UX uh, while still having a lot of sophistication. That's awesome. And, you know, with only two plus uh, um, freelancer on there, how do you guys, how did you divide the, the duties, somebody going after sales and marketing and you know, how are you growing the company right now? Yeah. So, I mean, as a founder, you do a bit of everything, right? But the way we divided <laughs> yeah. the work is uh, my co-founder, Sebastian, he's the CEO, but he's also the, you can say the CTO, he's building the product. Um, he's an amazing developer. Uh, uh, both Sebastian and I, uh, similar to I did Cobalt, Sebastian built another company before. And uh, he also worked at Google and so on. So, so he has a lot of experience uh, building uh, great products, um, and and uh, that of course helps. And then I'm on the um, my role as chief growth officer. I'm taking part, uh, taking care of marketing, sales, uh, but also a lot of the operations, support, all this stuff, right? Um, basically, yeah. So a lot of different things. Uh, <laughs> we we wear a lot of hats, um, but I think I mean. It's kind of intentional because uh, I think one, as you said, we've we've decided to bootstrap the business, um, and I think we are doing that because uh, we have experience now uh, building companies where we raise money, uh, and that was great and all. I'm not gonna say that's a bad idea or anything. Uh, for for some people, it's the right thing to do, um, and I think for us in Cobol, it was the right thing to do because we didn't have any past experience building startups. So we actually needed some support. We needed some uh, advisors and investors who could kind of help us on the journey. Um, so, so I think that was a good choice back then. But now when both Sebastian and I have this experience, uh, we know how to build products. We know how to kind of build a company. We don't have the same need to raise money anymore. Um, and uh, we're also seeing uh, a big trend, uh, this whole product-led growth uh, trend in the market where you can actually grow a business without uh, um, hiring a big sales team or hiring you know, a big customer success team. You, you let the product speak for itself. Um, of course, you still do marketing. You still do these things. It's, uh, that's a common misunderstanding. It's not that you don't do right. it, but it's that you automate a lot more. You kind of think product in everything you do uh, instead of thinking, let's hire a bunch of people to solve this problem. Yeah, no, I'm I'm a huge fan, and I do think it's never been an easier time to grow a, a B2B business, right? With it, everything's moving to digital for SaaS kind of led the the charge with that. But you're right, unless you're selling into large enterprise companies where you need you know those those sales organizations to help quarterback those big deals, right? If you can get the right marketing and the inbound flow working. You know, it, it's a heck of a lot less expensive and a lot more efficient. And I think most B2B buyers are much more comfortable now just 
you know, transacting online, right? And I'm sure that's changed a little bit in the eight years since Cobalt to what you're doing now. The go-to-market probably looks vastly different, right? Yeah, I, and I also think it's it also depends on your product, right? So Cobalt, we were, um, you can say there were incumbents in the market. There were, you know, uh, the security consultancies um, were in the market, but there was nothing like Cobalt, right? There was not a platform for penetration testing. Uh, and with uh, even with bug bounty, there was not a platform for bug bounties, right? Uh, so this, these were like brand new categories. And when you're building brand new categories, there's a lot more education to be done. Um, and that's harder to do uh, with a with a self-serve model. Um, so so I think Cobalt was also in a situation where we, we started out actually as a self-serve model. And for bug bounty, that worked pretty well. But for pen testing, I think for the... Because we were up against consultancies, uh, we needed to mirror a bit the experience of a consultancy, just a bit, right? Uh, create that trust through a sales call and so on. Um, because people were used, it's security, it seems kind of risky, right? And, and people were used yeah. to having that call with someone uh, to understand the model and so on, right? So I think we had to mirror it a bit just to move in the right direction. But then over the eight years, you start building so much trust in the market that then you can move to more and more towards a self-serve product-led model, right? And that's what we started to do at Cobalt, especially for the smaller customers. Uh, you, you know, suddenly because of the, our maturity, our trust in the market, we could build a product-led uh, model again uh, where where people were more self-serving, buying pen testing, right? Uh, which I think really is the future, right? Like, um, I, I think it, that's how it should, should work in the future, that it should be super easy to just sign up, buy a pen test, uh, move on, right? Um, yeah. And, and, and that's the direction Cobalt is in. Um, uh, and with Userflow, we were in a much more competitive market, right? So th it's a known category. Everybody uh, were looking at alternatives to existing solutions. So in that market, we didn't need the same level of education. So, so we could go out, just market our solution. And then when people came to our platform, they were more looking to see, okay, how does this product uh, differentiate from other products in the market, right? And in that way, you can just allow them to self sign up, experience that, that differentiation themselves, instead of having to go on a sales call to explain that, right? Um, yeah. so, so I think that's, that's something to always think about when it comes to product led. Uh, are you in a blue ocean or are you in a red ocean? And if you're in a red ocean, that's typically where product-led models work uh, very well, right? Uh, if you can yeah. differentiate yourself through your product. Well, and I think the other key that you guys are doing too, the experience, I think, is is still a huge differentiator in, in the B2B space. And then, right, the, 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 the user experience you talked about, but then the differentiation, being able to just cut through that noise, tell a different story, and then again, provide that experience is going to, I mean, I think people are willing to buy an average product, but have a great experience yeah. than a, a great product with an average experience. So I, agree. I don't get how companies still don't understand or execute that, but all right, it creates opportunity for a lot of other people. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a science, it's an art, right? In many cases, uh, it's, um, I think. So as I said, we, the gap we saw in the market was, uh, uh that, uh, the, it was hard to use a lot of these products and you have to send the signal of that user experience from, from your public facing website, right? Uh, you really have to like already from that point on, this is simple. It needs to like a uh, signal. This is a, a easy to use solution, uh, with a lot of power, right? And, and then you need to have a call to action towards that free trial and, and really drive them towards, uh, building their first flow within minutes, right? And that's really what we try to do at Userflow is like, you sign up for a free trial and you have a flow built in a minute. And then you're just like, wow, right? This is amazing. I can build this uh, with no help of developers. I, I can even preview it inside my application uh, and all this stuff, right? So that that's that's the kind of experience you wanna give because then you wow your, your prospects, right? Um, yeah, no, that's great. And interesting. So where, where do you think the first hire is going to come from as you guys start to expand? Is it going to be in customer success, marketing? Oh, where's, it's where's a good question. Go? It's a good question. I think we need probably more developers over time uh, just to backfill for <laughs> Sebastian. Uh, but uh, so that's definitely one thing. I'd also see 
the way I look at product led growth and SaaS in general is, uh, and this is a hot hot topic, right? But this is my bootstrapper uh, brain thinking. Instead, in a in a VC funded uh, world, you always hear this: Yeah, you need to build an organization. You need to really build. You know, over time, people need to specialize more. You need to have more specialized functions and all this stuff. But in a bootstrap business, you need to try to be as generalist as possible for as long as possible, right? Um, and uh, one of the areas when you say customer success, it's a role I see evolving into being more than the traditional customer success. And I think already in Cobalt, we gave our customer success manager sales responsibilities. Uh, and that I know was a hot topic in a lot of customer success worlds. They're like, ah, you cannot give customer success managers sales responsibility because then customers won't trust them, which I don't agree with at all. I think uh, it's odd that you have to switch person actually when you have to then talk yeah. about another topic. Um, and, and we saw it actually work very well that you didn't split it. Um, and I think in product led that becomes even more prominent, right? Suddenly you, your support person is the one who's also telling you about upgrades, telling you about, uh, you know, this, you could do this, right? So I see this new role evolving in product led, which is a, a mixture between sales and customer success. Uh, but somebody who knows the product inside out and knows what levers to pull um, to both sell, but also to retain, right? Um, yeah. But it's all with a product mindset. No, I think you're you're spot on. And yeah, it is. You can be a, uh, a contentious conversation with folks who still believe silos and some of those other things are, are effective. And right, I tell people all the time that man, sales business development starts with your customers, right? Who better to tell the story than them, yeah. <laughs> right? Versus you are uh, telling you know advertising. It just it just makes sense that you want to start with with the customer. And I do see those roles changing, especially the upfront sales folks tend to be more facilitators now than true sales. At some point, you still got to ask for the, the sale. Yeah. It takes the, the DNA. Yeah. But the role, I think, is much more customer centric. Like the old uh, saying, treat your customers like prospects and your prospects like customers. Yeah. I don't think it's ever been truer, right? So yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think it's, it's uh, I think it's like a gap in a customer. I actually, I would say some people would say, a customer success person uh, who doesn't know sales, that's okay. They're customer success. I would say that's not okay anymore. You need to know sales. Yeah. Sorry. That's the future, right? You need to understand sales as well uh, to be a, a strong customer success person. Um, that's so, so I, yeah, I think that's where the future is going uh, in my perspective. I think you're right. I think Microsoft's kind of started us down that path a number of years ago when they reorg their sales team and basically they move their uh, sales engineers that were good customer facing folks into those sales roles because they were finding that the, the sales engineers would have better conversations with the customers because they knew the product and how it worked and the usage. And so they started that trend probably a half, five, six, seven years ago now at, the, at this point. But yeah, it just Again, customers want you to be the, you, you mentioned the, the consultant or the trusted advisor or somebody that knows how to solve their problems, yeah. not just a sale. I just, I don't think traditional sales, right? It just does, just doesn't work anymore. No. Um, I, if it does, I, it's I'm not a much more strong long. believer in, in the, in the more generalist role that kind of covers a bit of, you can't be an expert, right? But you can be like, a, okay at sales, okay at customer sales and okay at uh, maybe sales engineering, right? And the most important thing is you understand the product and you understand what problem this product is solving for your customer, right? And and how you can solve different problems for your customer with this product. And then the customer will make the decision automatically if you can guide them towards that realization, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think in the world that we're living in now, the, the, the analogy I used quite a bit is like movie or movie productions, right? You got some people come in here and make up whatever role or specialist you need. They come in, they work on this thing together and then they, they go. And like, I don't think to your point, you don't have to build these massive teams anymore. You can bring in the specialists that you need to do a certain job, assuming you get the frameworks in place to, to manage those resources. But yeah. 
yeah, I don't, I, I think those days are long gone. And I, I think I may have mentioned off, you know, just before we hit record the last couple of guests I've had are building multi-million dollar companies with, you know, a handful of people. So yeah. again, if, if developers aside, right, because <laughs> that's a different, but from a go to market, it doesn't, if you set up the engine the right way, you don't need a, a ton of people or a ton of resources to do this. No, I agree. And I, uh, awesome. But having said all this, right, and now we talked a lot about customer success, sales and so on, really our first hires are, is a focus on developers and UX, right? And our first first real hire was a UX freelancer, right? So it's again going back to that the product is our primary growth driver. So we need to have a really strong product with a really strong UX. That's really the, the essence of our growth model. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate the the time and the education today. I think the like I said, I love the idea of talking with a somebody who's raised a bunch of money now bootstrapping and just giving folks different perspectives, right? That there is no one right path or wrong path and just understand the trade-offs if you you do go and raise money. But I would like to to follow up with you here in you know another six months to see how things are going. Sure. And we'll follow your kind of your growth journey and you know, anything else we didn't touch on today you think other entrepreneurs or business owners may find find helpful? Uh, no, I, I think we talked about a lot of great topics. Uh, if people want to learn more about product-led growth, then we we do actually do a, have done a video series uh, called Product-Led at Userflow, uh, which where we share how we do product-led uh, growth. Uh, so that's a great kind of inspiration um, for others to see how you can do it. Um, uh, yeah, um, so... That, that's something I recommend yeah, checking we'll, out. Okay. And we'll definitely link to that in the show notes so people can find it. And if people want to connect with you, what's the, what's the so best I'm on, way? I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, so my Twitter handle is SMFJ and I'm on LinkedIn as my name. Um, so yeah, uh, reach out to me there. Awesome. Again, link to it in show notes so people can find it easily. Perfect. But Asbin, thank you so much for, uh, for chatting with me today. I enjoyed it. So again, I think that you're, kind of looking at the companies of the future, this is the way we're going to see companies being built. So I appreciate you sharing your your time and experience. My pleasure, Brad. Thanks for having me. And have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks. 